Hi, good morning. We're here this morning to go over a few different sessions or, or a few different papers related specifically to stratification. The four papers that will be discussed today are in order are a tragedy of stratification, systemic exclusion and labor market mar matching of migrants by Marve Bernazoglu of Utrecht University, meta injustice and stratification, the case of energy. This will be presented by Robert McMaster, uh, but it's also co-authored by Lynn Chester and Amanda Elliott. And the third paper, uh, Persistent Mark of Migration in U.S. Immigration Integration as a Social Process by Noe Weiner. Um, and then, of course, the fourth paper, which is Addressing Societal Externalities to Promote Racial Equality, which I will be presenting. My name is Madhavi Venkatesan. I'm going to allow each author to give themselves an introduction because I think they are better able to give that than, uh, than, than I, uh, because this will hopefully focus on the areas of their immediate interest and the items that they'd like you to glean from their presentation. Two components with regard to this webinar. We do have a Q&A open. We'd like you to please put your questions specific to each author in that Q&A box. We will take Q&A at the end of the session, not during the speakers. So even if you put the question there, please be rest assured that we will be able to save the chat function and your speaker will respond to you, if not today, after this, uh, after this session or later uh, during this, the course of this meeting. Um, with that, I'm going to start off the session, please, with Marve, and I will have her take over the introductions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Madavi. I hope uh, you hear me and see my slides. So, um, yeah, my, my name is Marve Burnazolo. I'm a PhD candidate and uh, a lecturer at the Utrecht University School of Economics and the uh, the program of philosophy politics and economics and um yeah I, I work mostly in the field of philosophy and methodology of economics and uh, ask questions about identity and today the paper i will be presenting is titled a tragedy of certification systematic exclusion in labor market matching of migrants so let me start with um uh, let me begin with my motivation and the steps I follow to frame my guiding question in this paper. Uh, my motivation mostly comes from European policymaking about migrants' integration and the narratives used in this policy in the policymaking. And um, we see that European Union policy institutions consider integrating migrants costly and complex, but also as an investment that benefits host countries in long term. So employment is seen as a core instrument um, uh, instrument and means for integration, like a good. From the perspective of host countries, it is like a good because it's uh, necessary for integration and from the perspective of migrants, because it's, it's an instrument for a better life. So how are migrants doing in terms of this employment good? Well, the recent studies show that they are doing well, but not as well as natives we still see the persistence of wage gaps between migrants and natives. Uh, they still, the migrants still display uh, lower employment rates, concentration in low skilled occupations, and they're still more often um, overqualified for jobs than natives. So what underlines this gap between migrants and natives performances? The lower labor market performance of migrants is often explained by individual differences, such as human capital, based on individualistic explanations. However, the reports also argue that there is much more explained after, even after controlling for skills, education, and experience. So, for instance, for the overqualification rates, only one fifth of the differences are explained by skill differences. Another explanation for this gap uh, comes from systematic and structural factors such as social identity-based stratification. The European Union institutions recognize that the migrants and particularly refugees encounter structural obstacles as well, but oftentimes the solutions they suggest, I believe, fail to go beyond the skills and individualistic approaches. So, I suggest that we need to focus more on the structural factors in society, which individuals encounter, individual migrants encounter, not necessarily due to their individualistic characteristics, but social groups such as race and gender, about which stratification understanding can help us. So 
based on this stratification understanding, my guiding question in this paper is the following. Are migrants caught in a social stratification trap that ensures that they will fail to between their performances with those of natives. So I know that this question might sound uh, as an empirical one and can be answered by empirical studies to an extent, but I'm more interested in constructing some analytical and conceptual framings by using empirical insights from other studies in my paper. And in this presentation today, I will uh, highlight some of the main points from my paper. I'll first briefly uh, give mention the dominant view in understanding migrants' labor market integration. Then I will uh, introduce the main lines of the stratification approach, which I suggest to replace this frictional understanding. And then I will briefly discuss whether stratification is a trap or a tragedy. And uh, that part will mostly serve as actually ending the uh, presentation with a question. So first, uh, let me start with the frictional understanding of the labor market matching. So migrants' uh, performance in labor market is traditionally analyzed by using the human capital approach. And in this view, migrants are individualistic maximization seeking investors in human, capitals, in human capital. So integration in this view, uh, based on Mr. Becker human capital view, um, is seen as the integration in terms of income, the, the earnings, and the earnings uh, is a function, given a function of a soci a socioeconomic characteristics, whether the person is a migrant or a native born, and the years spent in the country. And it's, uh, the, it is assumed that the story is that migrants would first lack the necessary skills in local context, but by the time they invest and improve uh, their human capital, and they try to catch up uh, with, the, with the natives. So well, once they did, they are supposed to uh, have integrated economically. On the other hand, uh, search and matching theory serves as the basis of labor market analysis and applied to migrants' labor market experience as well. In this theory, migrants have uh, like migrants are like jobs, uh, job seekers, like ABC on the left hand side of the figure, and they have well identified skills that are uh, mentioned in the, within the brackets. And on the other hand, on the right hand side, the jobs have well identified searches of the skills. And in this story, the, the, they are supposed, the job seekers and jobs are supposed to match with each other. And um, the market is uh, assumed to eventually settle down to an equilibrium where every job seeker migrant matches with a job appropriate to their skills. So the primary aim of integration policies in such a world is to facilitate matching between job seekers and jobs, for instance, by helping um, the recognition and improvement of migrant skills. And this approach is very much in line with the human capital approach because it values skills over other characteristics such as identities. However, this perfect world is far from reality and labor markets are imperfect and perhaps even more imperfect for migrants than for natives. So the reports I mentioned uh, show the persistence of wage gaps and job mismatches for migrants. And in the simple case uh, that I show on the slide, for instance, job seeker A is not matching with job B, though they were supposed to match, uh, calls into the category called friction. And Petrongola and Pizardes famously argued that search and matching theory captures the effects of frictions in markets, however, usually without referring to the source of frictions. So in a way, they are like black boxes. And they call for looking into the black boxes in general labor market analysis. And I suggest that in migrants labor market experience, we need to do so by engaging more structural uh, approaches by taking migrants identity into account um, that I suggest systematically feed the frictions, these such frictions. And certification economics approach uh, and the certification theory in general is a way to open up the black box. So uh, now I will present the kind of certification approach I suggest, and I will first identify two exclusionary mechanisms based on previous studies by others and myself that might explain the sources of the frictions. The first type of exclusion that comes uh, is that uh, is the exclusion that comes from implicit characteristics. Because standard approaches in comics focus on skills, it tends to push identities into what we call noise or frictions. Uh, 
Yet we see many studies coming about and showing that uh, unexpressed characteristics such as identity marks can influence the matching. So job vacancies express what they look for, but they don't often express what they do not look for or do not prefer. On the right depiction, the, the, the picture, um, the figure on the right hand side, assuming that C is a character characteristic of being a migrant or a profile of a racial identity, the vacancies can be easily exclusionary if they have an implicit list that includes binary expressions such as non-C, which in this case simply meaning non-migrant. And stratification approach by emphasizing discriminatory attitudes structurally can tell us about these parallel sets of vacancies with different lists, which actually lead the operations in exclusionary ways. And the, the second exclusionary mechanism that I want to, uh, that I identify in the paper is the sorting of migrants by skills identification tools. In a case study I have run recently, I show how identification tools such as the one uh, European Union skills profile tool that was um, designed by the European Commission has the risk of sorting migrants into certain paths and sectors. So the simple depiction on the right hand side shows that it uh, shows how migrants that are indicated as R with more or less identifiable skills and characteristics go into the profile tools that is M and go out as profiles. So these profiles are, are like CVs and uh, I denote that as P, uh, and these are partially dependent, these profiles are partially dependent on how the tools were designed. And as a result of this identification process, the profiles um, are used to match uh, refugees in this case, but migrants also in general with the vacancies and the misidentification in the process may easily lead to mismatches or for instance, occupational segregation. So in this case study, uh, I've done before, I'm not necessarily suggesting that this profile tool, the policy tool is flow, but the identification and coordination it facilitates uh, can, um, even if unpurposefully, be leading to systematic exclusion of uh, exclusion markets by sorting migrants into certain destinations. So I've shown uh, two exclusionary uh, mechanisms that traditionally fall into uh, frictions yet with more and more evidence are getting recognition to occur in migrants labor market matching experiences. So based on these two mechanisms I introduced, I now would like to define the certified world for migrants experience, um, laying on the shoulders of those that I indicate on the slide uh, that are, who are engaging and building this new field in economics that is certification economics, such as uh, yeah, Darity Davis, Massey, Obeng Odom, Seguin, and Stewart, uh, which who are all, I guess, in this conference right now. So uh, first of all, certification economics is a theory of social exclusion based on social identity groups. And in this uh, approach, individuals aren't seen as atomistic individuals with neutral skills, but rather social beings with group identifications and therefore prescriptions that influence their motivations, decisions, and actions, and even the skills they own. And the social understanding matters for how exclusion works in markets. So the recent European Union policy on uh, migrants integration, I suggest relies on the mainstream economics understanding in that um, migrants are atomistic individuals whose behaviors can be known and adjusted. But certification economics, in contrast, does not analyze individualistic migrant whose behavior adjusts when there's enough investment. It avoids, as Obang Odom suggests, both ontological and methodological individualism, and certification economics is critical of standard economics rationalizing attitude. So rather than focusing on individual experiences, certification economics analyzes the roots of enduring exclusion and inequalities associated with social identities. Secondly, uh, analytically, we can assume that there are two types of destinations in society. As uh, jo John Davis made this distinction that while standard economics focuses so much on the public and private access in the goods typology, certification economics focuses on the common pool and the clubs to emphasize exclusion. Davis characterizes clubs as a set of exclusionary practices and institutions that systematically discriminates against certain groups of people. 
club-like institutions in which the privileged enjoy membership segregate other people into common pool type pathways. Common pool type locations are then places where people face economic vulnerability, uncertain income, and limited ability to accumulate wealth. So to explain how different people get different types of jobs, I follow Davis to focus on this distinction and suggest employment as a club good. This thinking is in line with instrumental view of employment for migrants integration, but it also allows us to think the question of access to employment and the exclusion that comes with that. So migrants I show from certain origin countries are filtered out um, of certain types of employment when employment opportunities are seen to be like club goods with implicit exclusionary mechanisms. Migrants end up being located in common pool type uh, employment situations by default and are in disadvantaged position in comparison to natives, but also uh, with mig in comparison to migrants from, for instance, other origin countries. So I suggest that societies organize labor markets into different destinations with sharply different sets of opportunities and thus migrants into different integration path. These destinations are taken by groups of migrants, not individual migrants only. And this leads us to another point about stratification economics, that is the hierarchy of social groups. So these two locations can be seen as the privileged and unprivileged locations in society. And in a stratified society, people are automatically located in these locations by their social group origin and with regard to hierarchy of social groups. So competition in such a society is not between individuals where Ger Becker would tell to clear discrimination, but instead competition occurs in several layers. So between individuals, but also between groups such as migrants and natives. And therefore conflict is central for stratification economics. So conflict is, uh, the group conflicts are not spelled out openly in the standard views and often ignored, but strat stratification approach emphasizes social power and ex uh, exploitation as key factors. And uh, enduring macro uh, patterns keep sorting individuals, individual migrants into different destinations. Uh, migrants encountered these pattern-like hierarchies in all walks of life from public services to labor markets. These macro patterns systematically subject some groups of uh, some groups such as migrant groups or racial groups to different forms of exclusion. And lastly, the normative scope of the mainstream migration, mainstream economics and the migration policy is limited to efficiency and investment in labor markets. It seems that the European policy aims to convince like actors, like the, the member countries to invest in migrants integration based on the expectation that they will uh, pay back this investment by providing the necessary labor force in the future. The stratification understanding proposes a shift in the motivation from efficiency to fairness, equal access and equal rights rather than efficiency, which is a fundamentally uh, different principle. So um, is stratification then uh, an unavoidable tragedy for migrants? Oops, pardon, I'm going too fast, yeah. So stratification functions like a trap for a certain group of people, particularly migrants. It reinforces itself by reproducing systems of exclusion and creates dilemmas for migrants such as for uh, getting integrated, you need employment, but for employment, you need integrate, uh, you need to get integrated first, etc. So I suggest that, uh, yeah, so this leaves us with the question, like are migrants caught in the social stratification trap that ensures that they won't be able to close the gap with the, with the natives? And I suggest that to, to uh, think about this question, I suggest parallelities with the tragedy of commons that Hardin famously proposed. So, Gerd Harden uh, introduced um, to explain like over exploitation of common pool resources and Harden's problem concerns governing natural resources. But in migrants case, the, the tragedy I su uh, suggest is not about over exploitation of the resources, but about being caught in a certification trap that, uh, that will ensure that migrants will fail to close the gap. So the question then is, can migrants escape such a trap? Then I look at Elnor Ostrom's. Elnor Ostrom asked a similar question about Hardin's tragedy back in time. 
and she proposed a fundamentally different view of common pool resources. So instead of sticking to unalterable tragedy scenarios and the helpless individuals in those scenarios, Ostrom analyzed the dynamics of governance uh, for common pool resources and institutions for collective action. Similarly, instead of seeing labor market mechanisms as unalterably um, uh, like leading to certification and the remedy to, to be in um, like overly optimistic investment view as, the, as I believe the European institution have, I suggest we see them as, as a collective action problem. And I argue whether we can think of labor market commons as institutions for collective actions. So in the common pool situations that Ostrom emphasizes, individuals possess social capital, which as part of their social group identity helps them organize and govern their resources. And similarly, I asked whether migrants can overcome social stratification by organizing themselves to compensate for exclusion-led failures by changing the institutions or the, the rules of games for themselves. However, I show that I show and argue that with the exclusion from native employment clubs, migrants can organize themselves and create their own employment clubs by making use of their social identities. So, in a way, uh, when they cannot get through the filters of the native club, uh, native clubs, they may form and move to alternative club situation uh, to lower their like employment search costs, reduce transaction costs, improve their bargaining power, share risks uh, that they face in labor markets, etc. So these clubs can be survival solutions to compens compensate for migrants' disadvantage uh, positions. Uh, but migrants often benefit from uh, being members of these alternative clubs. And with these new endowments that they have by being the members, they may refrain from uh, leaving that club and even try to match again with the native clubs. And we can call this stickiness of clubs, which would indicate uh, some institutional persistence. But I suggest this leaves us with a tragedy and even a dilemma that when migrant survival needs turn them to alternative clubs, the, the dilemma remain, remains and it becomes uh, a dilemma at a society level. So society now contains parallel and segregated migrant and native clubs and solidifying stratification uh, in the society even further. So certain people go to certain places for survival reasons. And when those people are, those places are sticky and they persist, more people may go there uh, for the same survival reasons. These new clubs, alternative clubs, may lead, lead to new power relationships within groups and contribute further to the reproduction of a stratified society. So therefore, migrant social dilemma now is um, expanding on this uh, societal level. So with this, uh, well, I have more discussion of this, like the question of like whether there is a way to escape the social certification trap uh, in the paper, but in the in this presentation, I will only reframe the questions I ask in the beginning, and I will leave leave it there. So the how uh, the questions I end with are: How can migrants and natives escape the certification trap, addressing collective action problem targeting exclusion? So I believe this should be the question we we, we must ask about the problems of the, the gap in the labor markets. And uh, yeah, as differently, how can the tragedy scenario turn into a circumstance in which integration is not only beneficial for migrants and society, but also results in more equal and just opportunities for migrants. So thank you very much for listening and yeah, look forward to the comments and the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Merve. I want to make sure everybody knows to please put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will be taking them at the end of the session. Also at the end of the session, should there not be an adequate time to address the questions, all participants on this panel will provide their email addresses. So you may please email them and continue the discussion with them afterwards. I will now introduce Noe and I'll allow him to give a more formal introduction with regard to himself and uh, we look forward to his, his conversation with us. Thank you. I actually thought it was Robert's turn on the, on the oh, oh, forgive program. Me. Forgive yeah. me, forgive me. I don't have it right in front of me. So Robert, forgive me. Uh, it's your turn then, please. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Uh, Happy New Year, everybody. I hope it's a good one, certainly better than 2020. I, by way of a brief introduction, this is work uh, at an early stage of development with my colleagues, Lynn Chester and Amanda Elliott uh, of the University of Sydney. Uh, this is uh, being funded by the universities of Sydney and Glasgow, uh, a collaboration fund uh, that, we, <coughs> that we hope to continue at some point in the future. I, in this paper, uh, we, we investigate the relationship or the potential relationships between Nancy Fraser's notion of meta injustice and stratific stratification economics with application to the, the field of energy. My, my colleagues, uh, Lynn and Mandy, have looked at energy for a considerable period of time and they've managed to uh, interrogate various patterns of energy injustice uh, over, the, over the period. Now, what we want to, what we want to argue in this, in this presentation uh, is that Fraser's, Fraser's concept of meta injustice offers, offers a way of illuminating the scales and different types of injustice, especially in the field of energy. I also, we feel that Fraser's notion could be developed and invites some consideration of the issue of rights, underpinning rights, I, that may well facilitate the promotion of justice in various spheres. We also take a view that stratification economics has a certain level of affinity with uh, Fraser's uh, approach. There are complementarities that we feel are unexplored. There's uh, certainly, we would argue, a shared repertoire between the two approaches. They, they complement one another. And I think that synergies, or we think that synergies, could be uh, further exploited by a more uh, developed and nuanced consideration of both. Uh, looking at, at William Darity's and, and uh, <coughs> Kirsten Mullins' latest work, From Here to Equality, I know that they, they don't cite Fraser. So we, we, we feel as if there, there, is a, there, is, there is a certain scope that would benefit both approaches, Fraser's notion of meta, meta injustice or meta justice and the stratification approach as embodied by uh, William Darity's work in particular. From here, I, <clears throat> we want to apply this to energy and justice. And we argue that this comes in a whole variety of forms. I, over the last 30, 40 years, energy systems have been restructured probably global, on a global scale, certainly within, within the European Union, this is very evident. Uh, Lynn's work in the past is, has spoken to this in, in considerable detail. That they've been restructured, energy systems have been restructured in such a way that they're dominated, or they tend to be dominated by transnational corporations with considerable power in oligopolistic markets, and they have extensive reliance on fossil fuels. And, and we feel, uh, and I, I think Lynn's work speaks to this uh, very effectively, that there, this has generated widespread inequalities in a variety of forms, such as access issues, issues of health, and also energy sacrifice, what's known as energy sacrifice zones. So the, the extraction of, of energy sources, fossil fuels, it necessarily imposes harms on various communities. So in terms of the, the presentation, I want to initially start, now that we've gone beyond context, now I want to initially consider an outline of Fraser's notion of meta injustice. And perhaps I'll, I'll spend, well, perhaps this has got the greatest emphasis in our, in our paper, I, and in our approach today, because we feel that people may well be less familiar with this as opposed to uh, stratification economics. So I want to elucidate this idea of the, the notion of, uh, uh, of meta injustice. From here, I want to move to stratification as a manifestation of, of injustice. 
uh, with particular application to energy, much in the same way as Mervyn talked about labour, we want to talk about an application in energy. And then perhaps to wrap things up, uh, identify the relationships with uh, notions of meta injustice, stratification, and perhaps rights as a, a, a way to a way to proceed. Okay. Now, <clears throat> our first observation really is that Nancy Fraser doesn't necessarily speak extensively about rights, but nonetheless, her her approach to justice presupposes a certain degree of, of, of rights or the existence of existing rights or the absence or the erosion of those rights. And we feel that, that a nice segue and a, a nice way to, to enter the, the, this notion or this consideration of justice is the, the, the following quote. I, I, I feel this is actually a very, very insightful quote in that justice is never experienced directly. By contrast, we do experience injustice, and it's only through this that we may form an idea of justice. I think that's incredibly insightful. I, and lends credence to Fraser's emphasis on the notion of meta-injustice. So by interrogating different types of injustices, we may arrive at a formulation or, or a fuller formulation of what is meant by justice. So what, is, what does uh, Fraser mean by uh, various forms of injustice and this meta notion, this overarching notion of injustice? Well, she identifies uh, three <coughs> domains that are interrelated. The boundaries are porous, but nonetheless, they are distinctive. They may exist at different levels of society, at different levels of reality. One may presuppose another. They have very complex relationships. There is feedback between them all. But nonetheless, we feel that this offers a potential way forward in terms of unpacking injustices as they occur uh, within energy, both how energy is produced and how it's consumed. So, uh, Fraser talks about material or economic, which relates to deprivation, exploitation, class, which is certainly missing from mainstream analysis, and stratification economics very helpfully reintroduces uh, in, uh, uh, in a very effective fashion. Cultural, where this ref refers to the social domain, uh, and obviously there's a hint here between that the, the relationship between the social and the material domains is very important, something that would appeal to this, uh, uh, this association, Association for Social Economics. So here there is a discussion of disrespect, non-recognition and so forth. And political, which I feel also embodies the notion of the legal framework in that it refers also to constitutions. So here, there's, there are issues of marginalizations, lack of representation and participation. Now, <clears throat> what Fraser then does, at least as I understand it, as a means of trying to combat those theaters of injustice, she, pre, she, she promotes this notion of a parity of participation. Now, for me, this has echoes with the likes of Armataya Sen, when Sen in his 2009 work talks about government by discussion. I, it also speaks to some of my work uh, uh, with others on economic democracy and such like. But in terms of uh, the, this advocacy of a parity of participation, uh, <coughs> Fraser breaks this down into different scales reflective of the domains of injustice. So she talks about the, the issue, the three R's basically, redistribution, which would appeal uh, certainly to the economic of the material, so it's the material resources. And this is to ensure an individual's autonomy or independence. And again, this resonates with a capabilities approach you feel. Then there is recognition, which speaks to the cultural or the social domain. 
Here, there's equal respect, social status commands equal respect, uh, regardless of background. And then we have the political, the representation. And here we have the, re the specific reference, the explicit reference to a constitutional framework, which invites consideration of the legal system, uh, I feel, within this. Now, within the context, within the context of energy, parity of participation implies and suggests certain universal and what may be termed as derived rights. Uh, and in the context of energy, this might be in terms of consultation before extractive activities can, can uh, be considered uh, to take place. Now, state regulation in this sort of field tends to be on a utilitarian calculus of about the, the, greater, the greater good vis-a-vis the, -vis more localised harms, arguably. I, uh, uh, as part of a cost-benefit analysis. Fraser's notion of, uh, of injustice in this context would feel, would, would, would argue or perhaps that the political voice, the representation of individuals who are, who are uh, impacted by extractive activities is not being sufficiently recognized and hence a particular source of injustice. Now, how does all this relate to stratification economics? Well, if I, I'd like to turn to I'd like to turn to this for the next few minutes, if I may. the The opening quotation here, uh, <clears throat> I think, captures the notion of stratification economics about the structural and intentional processes, the institutional underpinnings that generate hierarchies, inequalities, and Darity's work in particular is very concerned about income and wealth. It focuses on, on persistent income and wealth gaps, uh, especially between the races in the US. I think this speaks to a, a, a wider constituency in terms of, it, uh, it invites us to consider institutional arrangements, legal, legal arrangements, legal frameworks and rights, and also Fraser's it speaks to Fraser's uh, notion of, of injustice uh, because it recognizes that the economy reflects social values. Therefore, if an individual uh, or a group is lacking in social rights, in other words, there are cultural injustices, this will be reflected in the economy. And I think this adds sustenance to or background to the, the argument presented by the, light, the lights of Darity. Now, like uh, Merva, I, I, I think that, or we think the, that John Davis provides an incredibly lucid uh, demonstration of the power of stratification economics in a mainstream framework, essentially using this mainstream framework against itself. So, uh, without one of repeating what the previous speaker had said and established, there is this stratification economics works on the axis of between club goods and common pool resource goods. And we argue that this can be very effectively applied to the situation of energy injustices. And we identify various, in the context of access, various barriers which may impede uh, an individual's uh, quest for justice, as it was, uh, and promote or engender uh, injustices within within the, uh, the field of energy. So uh, those those barriers would include the ability to mean uh, the, the the ready ability to pay for services uh, provided by energy companies, energy sources, uh, access to appliances, artifacts, and so forth. Uh, that would provide, furnish what one would anticipate to be the very basics of a decent standard of living. Now, in terms of how this relates to rights, I think this is, this is very interesting because the mainstream approach used is a very contractarian approach to rights. In other words, it's everything is seen from a market perspective, therefore rights are very much seen as consumer rights. 
We would argue beyond this. I think stratification economics talks beyond this as well. Uh, but nonetheless, I think this can be provided by Fraser's uh, notion of meta injustices and its invocation of particular classes of rights, including universal rights. It goes beyond the market. So in terms of demonstrating this, it may be possible that in principle, people have rights of access, but in point of practice, de facto, they may well be limited. And in, in the US, given that this is a mainly US-based conference, we feel that there's a perfect illustration provided by uh, the, the plight of particular groups in society. Uh, recent work has identified how African-Americans pay approximately three times more for their energy than, than uh, white households in the US. Uh, this may well be a, 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 a result of uh, <clears throat> the nature of the built environment in which uh, African Americans may well be concentrated, they may be less fuel efficient and so forth. But nonetheless, this persistent energy inequality exists. Why, does, why, why should African Americans be subject to this patent injustice, one may ask? So in terms of, in terms of trying to, to wrap things up, I'm, I'm very aware of the time, what we argue is that stratification economics essentially, but not exclusively, relates to what may well be considered to be a Fraser's economic or material domain, given the nature of its emphasis on uh, inequalities in, uh, of, <clears throat> of stocks and flows, in, in, in particular wealth and income. Uh, we feel that stratification economics can illuminate uh, Fraser's notion of meta injustice, certainly in the context of energy, uh, in terms of demonstrating the persistence of inequalities, material inequalities, uh, and a means of interrogating this further that perhaps is not immediately, certainly as I understand it, not immediately amenable to uh, the framework that that. Uh, Nancy Fraser has constructed and developed over uh, many years. We also feel that stratification economics and uh, Fraser's approach certain, uh, has a certain resonance with capabilities, but also presupposes a certain distribution of rights. Uh, to go back to uh, John Davis's uh, heuristic investigation of of, strat of the stratification approach, the, the club goods vis-a-vis -vis the, the common resource goods axis, that presupposes a particular body of rights, a contractarian view of rights, whereas stratification perhaps can be broadened by an, an explicit invocation of, of Fraser's approach, which alludes to or, or certainly presupposes issues of universal rights, which goes beyond ma the market, and also derived rights. For example, is electricity a universal right or is it a derived right? A derived right being those where there's less scope for universal rights. So the derived rights are necessary for ensuring basic rights or universal rights. So for example, a, a reflection of human needs, such as shelter and food, may well be to some extent upon a, 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 a decent access to electricity, not necessarily as a universal right, but as a means of ensuring universal rights. I, I'm looking out the window at a, a winter wonderland here. Obviously, a, a presumption that in order to be comfortable uh, certainly in this env environment, we should have access to some, to some source of, of energy. And I think I, that <clears throat> Nancy Fraser's approach is very illuminating in terms of constructing an argument that goes beyond perhaps mainstream, the confines of mainstream reasoning. Uh, and also by doing so, I, augments the power of the arguments presented in stratification economics.
I'll end there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Robert. Now I will pass uh, the presentation on to Noi and, uh, and then we'll, we'll move on again. I, I would like to encourage you to please place any questions you may have in the Q&A. Uh, we will be compiling these as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madhavi. Um, just one second. Great. Um, my name is Noe Wiener, um, and the paper that I'm presenting today is called Complexity, Diversity, and Labor Market Integration, with some evidence from recent US immigration. Um, basically, the motivation for this uh, paper comes from thinking that the place of migrants, and this, there's a lot of echoes here from Marve's um, presentation, the place of migrants in advanced capitalist economies is complex. Um, the forces that shape outcomes for migrants are complex um, and contradictory in the sense that different actors in, in the society have different interests with regard to the extent of um, migrant integration and so on. On the other hand, there is a recognition that life courses, what happens to people over the course of their lives, um, is very, are very heterogeneous for natives and for uh, immigrants alike and that those life courses are segmented along lines of class, gender, race, and ethnicity, and other dimensions. But at the same time, um, I kind of uh, encountered, felt a certain frustration with existing empirical approaches to immigrant labor market integration, which Merve already alluded to, are still tied to a very straight line view of what economists unfortunately like to call assimilation. And um, this led me to explore uh, new to empirical tools. And I think those tools might actually have a broader interest for people in the audience here as an alternative to the standard microeconometric framework. And I think are more amenable to the kind of social, socioeconomic, social economy perspective that people take here. So, um, the main impetus and the main contribution of this paper is, uh, in some sense, a conceptual reframing of how we should think about integration, uh, certainly from a sort of observable uh, empirical perspective. Um, but there are some key results that I just want to anticipate in case I don't get to, which may well happen, um, which are that beyond the lower averages that we, we know about, um, immigrant cohorts in the United States generally start out with more homogenous incomes. Um, so this is another a new dimension of, of uh, integration that isn't usually looked at. Uh, I'm also finding that uh, recent cohorts appear to have stalled in terms of their integration in the sense that, and I'm going to explain this a little bit more further down, incomes remain strongly shaped by their immigrant status. Then there is some interesting interactive effects, one with regard to education that I'm going to talk about and one with regard to the intersection with race uh, and gender. In terms of education, I find what might be called educational downgrading, which is that immigrant status weakens the association between high levels of education, advanced levels of education and income, and it strengthens it for low levels. I'm going to illustrate this more. Um, and in terms of the intersection with race and gender, immigrant status has a smaller association with incomes for white men, and to some extent women, and a larger uh, association for Hispanic immigrant groups. Um, so with that being said, I do want to come back to a brief critique of the conventional microeconometric empirical approaches. So here, you know, the way these papers are usually set up, you think about um, economic outcomes, incomes here, YN, um, as being some function of a certain set of individual degrees of freedom here called XL um, and a set of unobservable um, uh, disturbances. And I just wanna illustrate, emphasize one point, which is that this really requires a very specific um, statement about the mechanisms that allocate incomes, which is here this function G. 
usually based on some notion of marginal productivity theory um, linked with uh, human capital approach of Becker, which is assumed essentially to hold for each individual. So this is a very, very, very strong statement about how, what determines incomes um, and usually tied to these individual attributes, one of which is time since migration, so the time spent uh, at the destination. And then any deviation from that expected value is taken to be the result of some um, individual disturbance term, which again, we have to assume some uh, distribution. So there's again, uh, assumptions embedded in the distribution of those error terms. There is uh, a lot to be taken apart here, but I wanna say that there's a couple of problems with this um, very individualistic approach. One is as there's a certain kind of hubris um, involved, which is that actually the relationships involved in shaping incomes for immigrants, which are relationships between behaviors, attitudes of people, the economic characteristics of those individuals and their outcomes are highly complex because they're shaped by institutional factors. They're shaped by a complex pattern of interactions between individuals. And to assume that we can uh, put a clearly specified mechanism on that is really a little delusional, in particular, since the data that we actually have is very, very sparse relative to what we are asking of it. We have these um, observations about specific moments in time, um, snapshots about individual attributes, and we're telling this very uh, specific story about it when we use the neoclassical neoclass microeconometric framework. I'm also arguing that there's a conservatizing impetus to this because using this microeconometric framework pushes people to um, take the individual attributes, since they're the right hand side variables of our regressions, as basically given and not questioning them as to their history, how they are shaped themselves, right? How are these economic characteristics shaped? Um, there's also a tendency then to say, well, if we find that social identity characteristics or let's say national origin um, characteristics uh, have, are found to have uh, non, non, uh, have significant coefficients that people are always gonna say, well, you have failed to control for X and Y individual characteristics. So there's this, um, you know, this discursive, um, uh, stress towards explaining away um, the role of social identity when you proceed in this way. So um, what I've uh, worked on with my co-author Paulo dos Santos is an alternative starting point really for, for thinking about the role of social um, identity in shaping people's um, outcomes. And what we've put a uh, try to identify with a new set of tools based on information theory really is this, you know, we link it to uh, uh, Martin Luther King's famous quote about being judged uh, by the content of their character rather than by the color of their skin or, you know, by some other social identity characteristics, which is the idea that we want to quantify the overall extent to which there is information in the color of your skin or the, the gender that you have, or some other social identity characteristic. And if that's a lot of information, it tells us that you are being judged um, on that basis, rather than on a whole range of other things that might also shape your income. And that there's on vice versa, other social identities where um, there is less information attached to that. Uh, in fact, there's in sense, some sense disinformation attached to an identity like being a white man uh, in the United States. And maybe I can illustrate this further, but here with respect to, you know, uh, draw, drawing here from, you might say criminology or just, you know, media discourse about immigrants. On the left-hand side, you see a snippet from CNN talking about uh, immigrants from certain quote unquote terror prone countries. So where these, this national origin is taken to be extremely uh, informative of what um, behaviors and attributes immigrants from those places have. And on the other hand, um, 
a, a terrorist attack by you know a native born white man which is then framed as being totally unrelated to that person's social identity right it's just a lone wolf wolf kind of attack and so I want to use this idea to think about the extent to which immigration status is one of those, you know, strongly shaping um, characteristics. And I'm very late. Okay, so the idea is that um, the forces that shape outcomes for immigrant populations are fundamentally political, economic, and social, not individual. And we've talked about some of those characteristics, perceptions, visa categories, social networks, and so on. Whereas um, the extent to which particular characteristics of immigrants affect outcomes are also socially shaped. The extent to which they can translate educational achievement and so on into outcomes is also socially shaped by things like occupational licensing, um, diploma equivalency and so on. So can we find a measure of the extent to which immigration status shapes outcomes throughout life? Here uh, I'm taking a notion from, immigration, uh, from information theory, which is in some sense that we want to start out with heterogeneity as the default assumption. So what we really want to explain is not the diversity of outcomes, but we are surprised by seeing um, patterns in our outcomes. So what you see on the left here is a very heterogeneous outcome distribution, right? This could be an income distribution. This could be a distribution across in geographic terms or something else. Whereas on the right-hand side, you see a very homogeneous in, um, distribution. So what can we learn from the differences between the heterogeneities um, of a case like on the left and of a case like on the right? This is linked then to the notion of mutual information in information theory, which is basically a difference in the entropy of, of distributions. But just to illustrate this very simply, you see on the left-hand side a case where um, an information, a, a, an attribute like color is completely uninformative, right? If I tell you that, some, that a, a, a point here is green, you are no, you know, no more about which uh, bin that that dot is located in, most likely. On the other hand, if I tell you on the right hand side that uh, an individual is green, you know exactly what bin they're located in. And so I'm using this information theoretical tool to analyze the trajectory of income distributions for immigrants versus natives. I'm using fairly standard data sources, the census, I can come back to this, but basically I'm not tracking individuals, I'm tracking cohorts over time as is very frequently done. So um, here are some results of that. Um, conditioning here on the level of education where you see some interesting results. So I've broken up the analysis by gender and you see basically that for more recent um, immigrant cohorts, they tend to start off with larger values here of this index on the left, left hand side. So you see values here like uh, almost 0.2, which is 20%. So if I tell you that, uh, uh, an that a person um, with less than a high school diploma is an immigrant uh, in a 2000 cohort, five years or 10 years after arrival, so this is in 2010, um, you learn, you remove 20% of uncertainty about that person's likely income. Um, so this is very, very informative of that person's likely income. Whereas you see um, in other cases, there's actually a little bit of the opposite. So if uh, you're a college grad, and I'm telling you that that you are, uh, that that person is, a, is an immigrant, um, you actually know a little bit less about that person's likely income after receiving that piece of information than you did before. But basically, there's a couple of stories here in this graph. Um, one is a cohort story. So arrivals start out with successively lower measures of integration that I already uh, mentioned. The other is an education story. So there's the strong association for high school dropouts and high school graduates, the left two um, boxes here. 
whereas there's very little association with immigration status for college grads. In some sense, there's even what you might call a heterogeneity premium to being uh, immigrant in those groups. You're less defined by uh, immigrant status. And there's a gender story, which is that over time, there seems to be more of convergence for, for women um, than for men um, in those groups. I then look at the interaction with other um, characteristics. So in this case, with education, and I'm looking at the extent to which certain educational achievements are more informative or less informative for immigrants as compared to the population as a whole. And basically what I wanna draw your attention to in this graph is on the horizontal uh, axis here is this measure of interaction information. If that measure is negative, it tells us that um, education, that particular level of education is more informative um, than for the population as a whole. Whereas if the measure is positive, so that the right-hand side of this dashed line, then it's less informative than for the population as a whole, okay? And so we have three levels of educational achievement um, and they are ranked here by their relative uh, wages. And basically what you see as we move forward in terms of immigration cohort, starting with people arriving in the 1950s, ending with people arriving in the 2000s, you see this very clear tilt to the right, right? Which tells us that for more recent cohorts, low levels of educational achievement, right? They tend to become negative in terms of their um, their index here value, which means that low levels of educational achievement are more informative for these groups, whereas high levels of educational achievement are less informative in terms of how they shape incomes for those groups. Um, you, in addition, see some tendency, right, as in previous generations, this would, this effect would dissipate over time with years since migration increasing, whereas that doesn't really seem to be the case in more recent cohorts. So as I already mentioned, immigration status weakens the association between high levels of education and income, strengthens its for low levels. Um, and among highly educated, the highly educated, immigration status is less predictive of income, uh, where it is more predictive uh, among the least educated. Just to um, come to the point of uh, stratification uh, a little bit more in terms of race and gender, Basically, we would expect that um, as people advance in their careers, um, that their incomes become more heterogeneous, right? People go into different fields, um, they progress or don't progress in their careers. And so all these um, identity categories that I'm looking at here, you see that um, their, uh, you know, the association in terms of their uh, identity characteristic and their age declines, right? Their incomes become more um, heterogeneous. But there seems to be a kind of stalling for some groups as opposed to others. In particular for women, um, this flattens out much sooner. And in that case, that means that identity remains highly, highly uh, informative of incomes. Whereas for groups like white men, it becomes actually disinformative as they become older, progress in their careers. And there, this difference in terms of stalling, I think um, is, is very interesting finding. So um, I'm gonna move on here. Basically it shows that the relative influence of social identity decreases for some groups, but not for, for others, right? And if we look at now the intersection with immigrant status, we find again that for some groups that immigrant status is highly significant. Once we tell you that a person is um, an immigrant, you learn a lot more about their income if they're um, Hispanic in particular, whereas it's really not that informative for white women and white men. And um, since I'm almost out of time, just getting to the, to the summary of this here, I'm finding that immigrant status has a smaller association with incomes for white men and women than other immigrant groups. 
um, we find that white men are on track basically to what economists call assimilate to white native men, whereas uh, for Hispanics, immigrant status remains uh, highly informative of incomes and is actually increasingly so. And there's an interesting crossover pattern um, for black men and black women. So briefly, what we might learn from this for the political economy of immigrant integration is that um, immigrants labor market integration is a social process, it's a political economic process, um, and not, is not usefully conceptualized as being a sort of individual um, trajectory, individual um, process, similar to what Merve already um, uh, mentioned. We also find that gender um, and race and ethnicity structure the immigrant experience significantly for the entire life course after arrival. One conclusion we can draw for political economy might be that um, in some sense, you know, it, it illustrates the fact that even once you're quote unquote integrated, um, you're still experiencing various forms of inequality. They're just not based on immigrant status. And that might help us understand why there's a tendency for some previous immigrant groups to distance themselves from more recent arrivals who do see their outcomes very strongly shaped by immigrant status. It might also maybe illustrate um, some difficulties with building broad coalitions across social identity groups, since it's very hard for people who don't see their, um, their outcomes shaped so much by social identity to really understand um, what's, what, that's, what that's like. And there's other points that I could make, but I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noy. Again, um, please, if you have some questions, please feel free to go ahead and put it into the Q&A. Uh, we will have our last presentation now, and uh, then we will go into the formal Q&A period. So I will be the presenter for this section. Uh, the title of, of the discussion I will be giving is Addressing Societal Externalities to Promote Social, uh, so, excuse me, Promote uh, Racial Equality. Um, there are two components to this that I'd like to just discuss with you first. Uh, some of this is going to be obviously repetitive and given the fact that we are in the same audience together looking at stratification is going to be dealing with the complexity of the social issues that we deal with in terms of looking at inequality issues. But the other part that I'd like to just point out is implicit in majority of our conversations is, is the idea that somehow the proxy, the income proxy is, is the goal. Um, and I, I'd like to hopefully open the question to that. I may not have time uh, towards the end of this presentation to do so. That's why I'm inviting it at the very beginning. So when we look at, at uh, African-American status in the United States, it's, it's uh, very unique. I would say in the United States, it's uh, the only other group that we could look at perhaps, uh, which is neglected oftentimes is the, are the indigenous populations uh, and what has happened to them specifically in terms of their economic status as well as their status in terms of their marginalization. Uh, they are so marginalized, one could say that they're almost invisible. But this conversation that we'll have today is gonna to deal specifically with African-Americans. So I wanna just talk about three, oh, excuse me, four points, which are the social construction of inequity, uh, societal externalities, which is a term that I'm actually referring to, which has to do with the, the impact of immoral behavior, um, what we consider to be immoral behavior on term, in terms of the general economy, in terms of our general perception uh, and fear and comfort in a society, the cost that comes from, from that immorality. Uh, economics of legitimacy and legitimacy of bias, and this is what I'm referring to in this point, is basically to discuss how economics, the profession itself, in many ways, based on the so-called objective stance that we take in terms of modeling, has actually implicitly uh, accepted the discriminatory bias that exists in society. And there are pr plenty of examples of that. I'll only give one or two. Uh, and then the, the last part, uh, which actually deserves perhaps a much longer conversation and hopefully uh, you'll be able to read the paper as well as other things that I've written, which is a rationale for a social mission statement. Uh, a large portion of the problems that we see from my perspective come from a lack of an anchor to what we're actually trying to attain. 
So what I mean by that specifically is in terms of our economic assessments, we iteratively look for improvements in income and wealth positions as proxies for well-being. But they are just that proxies. They don't necessarily signify well-being, number one. Number two, well-being, uh, because it can be based on so many other factors, may not necessarily be modeled appropriately within our economic system. So perhaps the door is open now, especially given other externalized crises that are occurring uh, that affect human life on this planet, period, to start to think from a more sustainable perspective. And that door is what I will end with today. So I'm just gonna go through this relatively quickly because I do have several slides, but majority of them are photos really to try to show you the issue from a more uh, empathetic perspective of what we're dealing with on an intergenerational basis when we talk about uh, marginalization of African-Americans and black people in the United States. The thing that I would like to start off with is the fact that we are a moral philosophical discipline. So our foundation, fundamentally lies on this idea and this presumption that morality guides us in our preference structures and our demand function. So if we look back to the roots of our profession and we look at Adam Smith, I find this particular passage very important in terms of just starting the foundation of, of any kind of discussion related to inequities. To disturb the happiness of another individual just because it suits our needs seems very inappropriate. But when we look at what's happening uh, in terms of marginalized groups, regardless of where they are, and specifically with regard to the conversation I'm having with you, that is what we're dealing with. But there's also another passage from Smith that I will address in a moment uh, that will hopefully show you the complexity of this concept of morality uh, because it isn't a singular definition. So when we look at uh, the history of race, number one, it's just, we, have, we have all uh, come to the conclusion that it is a social construction, but it is a social construction that was very deliberate. And we look at the history of it, the thing that's really important is to understand that cross-sectionally how it has a, impacted different people at different points in time and affected their perceptions and has instilled certain stereotypes. This is inherently what the complexity is. Additionally, what I would call observational causality, depending upon where you are born, what time you are born in, you may give a causation for what you see around you in terms of marginalized peoples based on the norms of the, that prevail at that point in time. So that adds another level of complexity and then taking it longitudinally uh, and, and in effect, basically allowing that observational causality to occur as well as people's observations of things, you're adding an additional multiple levels. So it's very important that we have a historical understanding of how race has been institutionalized in a very negative way so for us to even begin to start to peel back those, those uh, layers. So in, in terms of just craniometry, obviously that's the beginning, but then we also go to something that not everyone is unfortunately familiar with, but this is an actual visual that could affect people's perceptions of hierarchy or stratification of, of human life. And this is the human zoo. So from 1904, all the way to this picture on the, on the right was taken in the 1950s and that's in Belgium and that's a Congolese child. So, you know, the, the, the issue is not, it is not in doubt that race was created as a means of a justification of the subordination of a group of people for the economic betterment of another group. So inherent within it is a need to somehow justify the immorality that's perceived and that's really a role that religion plays. A religion gives us an ability to actually step away from our hypocrisy of our own understanding and beliefs and accept a reality that's only for individual benefit and, and because we have said that another group of people are net less than human. And this is really important as we continue to go forward. But I thought there's also interesting to bring up some historical points that often are neglected in this discussion, the concept of a moral issue related to how we look at African-Americans or Blacks in the United States was noted early on by Gunnar Myrdal. And, uh, and many of you are very familiar with his work, uh, American Dilemma. And he did win the Nobel Prize as did a few other people that we will be looking at in terms of just their comments. So race only has a biological element because we give it one, which is a very important point. Uh, in terms of just science, science would say that race doesn't exist. But if we look in terms of how science and particularly economics as it tries to become and call itself a science, 
talks about race, it always includes race in, in spite of the fact that the categorization is not a fair categorization, it is a construction. And there is an issue there. Um, and, I, and I hope that we can talk about that in, in a moment. So uh, this, this, these next few slides are really just more to, to actually just provide some background for those of you who may not be as familiar with the United States uh, issues with regard to race, that race has existed, persisted for multiple different reasons. Um, the marginalization has as well. But the important part here that we'll also bring up just briefly a little later is on the part of the marginalized, the other part that we don't seem to take into consideration in the evaluation is inclusion takes on different values or meanings to people depending upon their circumstances and the, the issues that they've had to deal with. The assumption that somehow inclusion in terms of wage parity and that type of occupational inclusion is sufficient is, is very limiting into this, in this discussion because when you've allowed people to be marginalized and persist in their marginality, what you also have done is created a new set of goals and a new set of issues. So this part right here ties directly to us from the standpoint of Becker, because I would say Becker is an example of, of observational causality. You observe, you see the causation, you apply a so-called rational economic model as being the solution. But theoretically, as was brought up by in our discussion, our keynote, our plenary discussion yesterday, the market is not efficient. It is, it is basically the, out, the outcome of a market mechanism is whoever has the greater strength, who has the greater capability of exploiting the other and weakness is usually the determinant of price. So from that perspective, we rely heavily, especially implicitly in most of our discussions about somehow at some point in time of, 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 of uh, invoking the market as somehow being the salve for, for the issues we face. And I, I think that we need to be a little bit more concerned about that. And I'm just going to say this from the side that I had a, a conversation I had with a colleague a couple of days ago, where I was talking about just GDP. And, and he noted to me, GDP is mainstream. People ag agree that it's not a good indicator. Well, it's one thing to agree. It's another thing to actually put it into practice. And until it's actually in practice, the agreement amongst individuals and being mainstream with regard to a use of an indicator or a lack of value of an indicator doesn't really matter. So that's one thing I would just like to point out. We still continue to default to natural market mechanisms as a means of determining whether we have reached a point of equality or equity. Um, so in terms of this, I'm just providing additional background here, but this part right here that, that's important to you is just in terms of the arrows quote, uh, which is related specifically to the fact that that market models do not and are not sufficient in order to determine uh, or find a, a, a solution to the issues related to racial disparity. So this is the quote that I alluded to early on when I first uh, started, and this is the Smith comment. Adam, well, looking back at Adam Smith, Adam Smith, you know, is basically saying that we all want to be part of a society, but our biggest limitation to our own sense of right and wrong is our desire to be included. So there is an issue. There is a desire inherently to be good, perhaps this moral component, but depending upon where we sit. In our, in our societal grouping, we may actually gravitate towards norms that are not necessarily moral, but give us, give us the group identity that we wish. So for a dominant group, we may continue to allow for the persistence of discrimination. And I think this quote from Johnson, actually, I, I like it quite a bit because it sums up some of the issues that we're talking about here. And it sums it up very clearly that there is a recognition that there is an inherent historical disparity and that, in fact, we cannot just assume that just looking at economic variables alone are sufficient in determining whether that disparity is starting to close or that gap is narrowing. And this, of course, comes from Derek Hamilton, and it's related specifically to education. Uh, I won't go through the details, but the other, other assumption that we do have in economics is that somehow, again, going back to income as the proxy for well-being, as opposed to 
understanding that well-being is being proxied by income means that we're also then, of course, looking at the inputs related to education because we're looking at that proxy, but the proxy fundamentally has become the goal in and of itself. So why is it that we have all these issues continue to persist? I showed you a couple of pictures of the human zoos, but then when we look at these photographs, and I'm going to show you a few of them, and you see the large group of people around and surrounding these individuals who are obviously being harmed, have been harmed, or are dead. And you see this as an entertainment element. And think about this transmission intergenerationally. You can see very clearly that the complexity of the problem is not one that is just economic. And that is something that that causes a, an issue for us as economists, especially if we are looking to find and facilitate solutions to these problems. So each one of these photos I'm showing you show groups of people surrounding one individual who is being victimized. And this is not unusual because even when we get to the current period, we know that was also the case with the Rodney King beating. Um, forgive me, here we go. I was hope, hope, uh, hoping that the video wouldn't start. Uh, Eric Garner, and then of course, George Floyd. So black men have a, this, 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 this situation that we're dealing with today with the Black Lives Matter movements are coming out of this intergenerational stereotyping, this causation this, that's, that's attributed uh, to the stereotype on one hand, but then it's legitimized by statistics on the other. And the statistics themselves come out of the discriminatory element at one point in time. So they give a so-called objective stance to the perception of individuals. But the point I'm trying to make here is that when we start to look at the intergenerational comp uh, uh, components, the, the way in which Black men specifically have been perceived has actually been a victimization to themselves. And that victimization means uh, basically that they feel fragile and, and at risk. They don't have the ability to actually feel comfortable in certain neighborhoods because of the fact that they feel they may be victimized. So in terms of a couple of research art articles related to this, uh, we, we, we have, we have information, we have assessments, we know that there is based on historical stereotype and precedence that individuals, black men have been dehumanized, that dehumanization has escalated the amount of violence upon them or that they have had to deal with in terms of the general public has perhaps also desensitized society with regard to the issues that they face in terms of violence from police officers, but also has provided through legitimacy of statistics, a rationale for why they should be considered to be uh, dangerous. So these two studies that I, I won't go into in detail here, but they, they provide some foundational element to my paper, provide you with some indication of the how the pre-existence of, of, of these ideas with, that surround African-Americans and Blacks that are coming from intergenerational origin and the causality is not clear, it is not linear. So when we look at Black male wages, uh, specifically during up to the most current period, the, this issue with regard to how they have been stereotyped, how they've been marginalized and how uh, they have been uh, limited in terms of equitable distribution is not often captured. It all depends on the way that you cut, dice and slice the data. In this particular study here, what, what the finding was that if you incorporate incarceration and structural changes in the economy, which have led to unemployment for certain groups of labor, the unemployment rate for black men has not necessarily changed. Um, in, in terms of something uh, that, ha that has narrowed relative to white men. And on top of that, uh, other than looking at individuals who go to the highest levels in terms of professional attainment, the wage gap has not necessarily changed. Now that's another issue altogether that we will, we will hopefully have an opportunity to discuss at some point. Um, looking, I'm, I'm also cognizant of the time. But in looking at, in, in terms of the wages and in terms of looking at high occupational levels, the question you also have to take into consideration, which we will not be able to discuss here, is the issue of convergence versus, versus inclusion. So perhaps what we're looking at when we look at areas of 
uh, in terms of high income attainment is a convergence towards the prevailing social norms, as opposed to an inclusion of people who may have different thoughts and different backgrounds. And this is a very important aspect of our of, of discussion as well in terms of the complexity of this issue. So I'm just going to wrap up really quickly, but in terms of the solution, because I, I, I'm focused on thinking of how, given how complex, how intergenerational, how persistent marginalization is, how difficult it is just to map out equality and equity based on economic variables, which themselves are just proxies of underlying well-being. And given that income and wealth are not necessarily, even if they are in parity, it consistent with well-being because there are many studies that can show very clearly, especially dealing with Eastern people from uh, East Asia, that just because income parity has been attained doesn't mean that they feel included. In, in other words, uh, lack of inclusion continues to persist in spite of income parity. So well-being is not necessarily attained. So how do we attain well-being in a situation uh, like the one that I've described and the one that we live in and as African-American men only being one subgroup of that? Well, I, I looked at it from the standpoint of a stakeholder engagement model. So fundamentally, if we can show how this lack of inclusion from the standpoint of acceptance of the social injustices perpetrated on this group of people to actually create and manifest this marginalized status that they currently hold has adversely affected us given perhaps me the comments that I shared with you from, from Adam Smith, the morality, the, the in, intrinsic element in us to want to actually align to virtue, perhaps that could be a qualitative economic cost. It is translatable into a social cost of fear and anxiety. And when you think about it from that perspective, the elimination of that social cost yields a benefit, which is benefit of a cohesive and so social structure, a cooperative system. So I, I am advocating uh, in my paper as a stakeholder engagement model, as a vehicle for promoting a national uh, unity. In other words, some sort of mechanism by which we can actually talk to each group in, despite their differences in terms of their perception of race with regard to aligning their individual interests to an overall well-being interest for all. So uh, in this particular case, and I'd be happy to discuss this further if anyone has an interest, I look specifically at communication and educational channels and an alignment to a common goal, which I call a social mission statement. Arguably, we do not have a social mission statement today. We have supposedly implicit ones, but all of these relate to wealth, income, accumulation. And in many ways, these are in opposition to the very types of uh, criteria that we should be focusing on. So I uh, look at sustainability in general, so I, I believe fundamentally at this point in time, given the crises that we are in, both in terms of environmental crises, as well as social justice and social, I should say, injustice issues, this is an opportunity to create a new, new model of, of how we interact in our economic system that's related to sustainability. A sustainability related perhaps me through the adoption of sustainable development goals as a policy tool because what we're actually seeing is the values as one of the other speakers has noted, being either what is expressed or inc inconsistent to what is expressed. Our market mechanism oftentimes provides a veil for us not to see the discord or disconnect between the values that we have and the injustices that our actions create. So this in very quick summary, what I'm really referring to is at this point in time, given the complexity of issues, perhaps maybe we should be changing the parameters of our discussion and not necessarily looking at uh, the same tools uh, that, that actually created the economic injustices that we see, but perhaps maybe looking at new tools that create a more cooperative system where social justice is more aligned. So with that, I'm going to stop and thank you very much. I'm going to invite all the panelists to come back, please. And again, we will start with Q&A. Uh, 
and I'm going to start off with uh, Marve, if that's okay. I, I know that we have a, a specific question from Noe from, to you and maybe other comments as well. But again, we're opening it up to the general, uh, general participant group. I'm going to invite all participants to please put their email addresses in. Uh, well, actually we don't have opportunity to put it into the Q&A because I don't think we can type into the Q&A. So that is our limitation. So our email addresses are available on the program. So if I can go to Noe. Great, I'm gonna to try to be very quick here. Um, basically, I thought this was really enjoyable paper that makes uh, some great points. I particularly like the idea of the, of the labor markets as being composed of, you know, collective, really a collection of collective action problems, social coordination problems. And to look at integration from that angle, I think is really excellent. I have two questions basically. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with characterizing employment as a good um, because I think it, you know, it makes this, takes this employment dependence, A, sort of at the basic level, takes the employment dependence of migrants as given, uh, doesn't question the, you know, the, the role of employment in capitalist society, and B, it seems to misclassify migrants as consumers of jobs, puts the emphasis on their on their um, behavior and preferences um, and so on. Um, and then the second issue is with the tool of stratification economics. It's just one, my ignorance with some of that literature, but um, it seems to locate all the strategic action um, of what's going on, which is so important in social coordination problems in the competition between non-class social identity groups, which is definitely relevant, but very little in the interaction between workers and employers. And uh, looking at uh, older literature from labor segmentation theory, there is the concern there that, you know, some groups, let's say employers might mobilize social identity to, you know, strategically to divide groups and so on. So there's a third actor there that doesn't just exclude, but that uses division to, exploit, let's say. So there's, in addition to exclusion, there's exploitation. That's relevant, right? Because it might point towards other um, solutions, um, not just creating alternative clubs for, for immigrants, but abolishing all clubs. Um, yes, that's it. Okay, should I go ahead? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Noe, I, um, for these yeah, two points. And I'm very happy to hear that uh, you found some merits in the paper and you enjoyed reading. Uh, for the first point you made, I remember uh, having heard similar um, yeah, kind of critique from other people about like uh, conceptualizing employment as a good, which would then directly put migrants as like consumers of that good. But um, I, I would agree uh, with that. But on the other hand, my, um, the, my motivation to think about employment as a good would be really strategic that because I want to emphasize exclusion that uh, yeah, the stratification uh, would tell. So in a way, it's like a trade-off, I would say that by that kind of conceptual conceptualization, I try to make again following Davis's um, uh, yeah use of the common pools and the clubs. I want to really emphasize exclusion in an analytically systematic way, so that we can try to find also like empirical ways to track, you know, how migrants get ex excluded in labor markets. So that's more a strategic uh, choice. Um, for the second point about yeah, focusing on social identity groups and not really workers and employees, etc. Um, I think well, this this question can be asked not to me only, but everyone in this session and like the the people presenting in certification sessions. But um, again, here I would agree that uh, abolishing all clubs would make sense. But again, I think my rather quick answer would be that if you don't name the social identity groups, and if you just focus on workers and employees, we just keep ignoring. So again, for the sake of not ignoring and making something visible, I think that's a more, again, strategic choice in the analysis that we have to make at times. 
So that's kind of like a direct answer I can give. But again, I would agree with you about abolishing all clubs and <laughs> dealing with different things at hopefully uh, at some point. So yeah, thank you very much for the comments. You, you, have another, you have a question as well. I'm gonna go ahead and take one question from the audience. How can you connect your approach to ethnic enclaves or test your theoretical framework? Okay. Uh, so testing a theoretical framework, I'm not sure if I know the enclaves, the, the, what that refers to exactly, but let me take the part about testing a theoretical framework. So, um, well, more than te testing the framework that I'm proposing, I'm already making use of other empirical studies to fill in my claims in the theoretical framework. Uh, for testing, uh, yeah, well, it's a good question. I, I I need to think more about. So I cannot directly come with an answer right now for this. But yeah, thank you very much for asking. Thank you. I'm gonna to go to Robert and I have I have a couple of questions for you, Robert, if that's okay. Um, the first one, going back to uh, the slide with regard to African-Americans and looking at the concept of energy. Uh, energy, unfortunately, in terms of use and uh, value, sustainability, which actually causes perhaps an increase in uh, energy efficiency, is considered a luxury good. So how does that, uh, how does that fit into the discussion? Uh, because here, if, if, if sustainability or energy efficiency is actually tied to a luxury perception of energy delivery systems, uh, then would we not often see any kind of uh, actually almost like a regressive, aggressive component with regard to individuals who are in lower economic levels? Thank you very much. I, <clears throat> I'm not overly familiar with the with the relationships here in terms of uh, in terms of this notion of sustainability being a, a luxury good. I I've come across similar arguments about uh, ethical consumption, uh, sustainable consumption, sustainable production uh, being yeah very class based. Uh, which is probably where I feel more comfortable. Uh, it does resonate with what you're saying about luxury goods. I, that's uh, it's it's a bumper of a question. I honestly don't know. Uh, I honestly don't know the answers to this. In terms of uh, you, 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 you identified the specific case of African Americans and and the energy. Uh, the way I was using it was in terms of a, a particular injustice that reflects, a, as I understand the literature, that reflects where the a significant proportion of African Americans reside in energy inefficient housing. So this is tied up not just with energy injustice, but energy injustice is complexly related to issues of housing, accommodation, and also income, income inequalities, where uh, uh, on average African Americans are, 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 are experiencing what may well be said as energy poverty, simply because of the need to heat, cool their own homes, etc. Uh, access to the latest energy efficient uh, artifacts such as uh, white goods and so forth. So I think sustainability, sustainability uh, as in many, many, many aspects of sustainability that go beyond race, uh, that embody class as well, uh, are, are uh, issues of broader justice and I think we have to recognise as such that uh, to promote sustainability, we also need to promote uh, justice in various theatres. That's that's perhaps the best uh, off the cuff answer I can uh, 
uh, I, I can, can think can of. I, can I just come in and add? Lynn might, well, Lynn might well want to add and illuminate. Yeah. yeah. Um, a couple of general points. I mean, it's um, systemic that lower income households pay higher proportions in energy costs. Um, so forget about race, start thinking about income. And Bob's made the point about um, housing. Um, it, it, sustainability, I think you're using in a way in terms of access to renewable energy sources. Um, and as Bob's pointed out, I mean, we wouldn't really call that a luxury good. How access to renewable energy sources has been structured has excluded a lot of people. And I'll use the business model for access to solar PV. It's structured around um, households having the income for upfront capital costs. Um, it's not structured for private low income renters. So you might refer to it as a luxury good. We would call it exclusion. We would call it an energy injustice because people don't get the opportunity because of income levels and because they're not owner occupiers, they don't get access and that's an injustice. And it's compounded by um, what we call inefficient housing stock and a whole range of a uh, lot of other things. I hope that helps answer it. We, you know, it's very much sort of a class-based energy injustice rather than perceiving it as a luxury good. Thank you. I'm going to go to Noi. Um, Marve, do you have a comment? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, no, I, I really enjoyed reading the paper and uh, I can only agree with you, like with the points you raise, such as you're criticizing the existing approaches to be strong, strongly individualistic, how integration is seen as the success or failure of the immigrants, so the one-sided story, and the core aspects you identify that cannot be captured in the yeah, standard regression framework. There was a lot to learn for me in your paper. So overall, I see the paper as a great empirical source and you suggest alternative tools uh, to, you know, uh, alternative empirical tools for yeah, analyzing integration and stratification, which definitely raised my interest for information theory that you use, which I'm rather ignorant, I, I must admit. Uh, so I have two questions. The one is about, uh, yeah, Again, I would like to remind my, my ignorance of the information theories. I don't know much about it. But my first question is about the model-free measure of integration that you're using. And that directly reminded me of the measurement without theory. And I must ask, A, why model-free and is it a good thing? And B, uh, wouldn't it run the risk of like other building ingredients in your measurements. So I don't know the selection of uh, variables, conceptions, identity categories, etc. cetera. So, so this is kind of my first point about the model free measure. Uh, the second one is, um, so I really find the, the findings interesting. And I was asking myself, I, I found myself trying to track some um, parts about like, uh, the reinforcing character of stratification that also I was talking about, we have been talking about. So you, uh, among other things, you told that the migration status remains highly informative of income, even more so for some groups, I guess. So I was thinking like, does this tell anything about the reinforcing ca character of stratification? And uh, like, the can the findings tell, for instance, anything about the changing forms of exclusion for different groups? For instance, can we say like US has become a less stratified society, I don't know, with respect to gender, but more stratified society with respect to race, etc. So, I mean, I know you have given quite some findings, but I would maybe I'm still trying to, you know, find like simple answers to, yeah, maybe big claims. <laughs> so but thank you very much for sharing the paper. I enjoyed it. Can I respond? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that, Mary. Um, 
uh, the easy answer, the easy part is the one about model free to some extent, it's some extent easy, um, which is, I think that it's actually more radical uh, of an approach because it basically says, as long as there's any association and we're not, you know, I'm not saying like, I know what the channels are through which immigrant status conveys information, but as long as there's any such association, there is a question mark. I'm not like, giving the answer to, you know, is this legitimate? Is it illegitimate? With the case of um, race and gender as being predictors of, of outcomes, I think it's clear that at some level, all association between race and outcomes is illegitimate. It's like, that's the sort of radical aspect of this work. With immigration status, you don't expect all of this to be illegitimate because people do integrate, right? But, but if it never happens, if it doesn't happen in second generation and so on, then there is a, it raises these policy questions, but it just raises them, it doesn't answer them. But I think in some ways it's much, it doesn't really suffer from the measurement without theory problem because it says all those associations are, you know. Um, the reinforcing character does it what does it tell us you know i think that part is the weak is weak because i just don't know i don't know this stuff enough like i would love to hear to talk more with you later on at some point about what uh what it can tell us about changing forms of exclusion uh, certainly seems to be that recent immigrant cohorts uh, that identify as hispanic are um seeing much worse outcomes and uh that that's what exactly that has to do with, you know, I, again, I don't know. Um, there's a, there was a Q and a question in the yes, Q and A, should I take that? Yes, um, I would. I'm gonna read it first, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you take into account downgrading of migrant skills that happen upon arrival? Um, so to so, to, that's partly what I'm trying to do with this graph that shows, you know, the increasing tilt, which says that um, basically if you have, high levels of education, that's not as informative of incomes. It doesn't tell you as much about people's um, incomes as it does for natives. For natives, they're sort of at the, at the horizon, perfectly vertical. For them, you know, if you have higher levels of education, it's as informative as low levels of education. That doesn't mean they have the same incomes, levels of incomes. It just means there's a stronger association for immigrants. Uh, for for natives than for immigrants. That's the extent to which I can identify downgrading. I think there's other things that aren't observable in the data that I have, such as what are the where did people acquire this inform this education? Is it in uh, their country of origin or destination? All of that I'm barely I can barely take into account. Um, I'm just looking at people who arrive um, after. Uh, so age 25 to 35 after people have finished, most people have finished their formal education. So that's the extent to which I'm controlling for that issue. Thank you very much. I know um, in my case, I had some issues with where my computer failed and I was not able to deliver my paper to Lynn. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any comments to make uh, Lynn uh, with regard to that. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, look, I really enjoyed a lot of the material that you presented, but I felt um, given us, we would probably agree with most of what you said, um, e.g. race being a deliberate social construction. Um, and I guess I was impatient to get to your final slide um, because all of the comments that you made, I wanted to see a solution. Totally agree about um, the proxies, the economic proxies for well-being, um, e.g., income, etc. Um, the role of religion um, and the role that's played in the social construction of race. Um, so when you got to your stakeholder engagement model, um, I wanted to know how, I wanted to know how you're going to align individual interests to an overall common goal to, to achieve some sort of national unity, given all that you'd previously outlined right. about marginalisation of so many people and those social constructs, the values that are embedded, et cetera, et cetera. How do you overcome all of that through a model that's seeking to align individual 
um, interests with a common goal. Um, and it, it, I came back in my head, I kept coming back to how do you confront that, the role that religion has played um, to date in such a sort of stakeholder engagement model. So I guess I really want to see the next paper on the stakeholder engagement model. Um, I really thank you so much for opening the door for me to talk about that just even briefly. Um, I, I run a nonprofit and, and we are a grassroots organization as well. So that's something I've done on the side. And perhaps if I had not done that as part of my academic life as well, I would have a little bit more difficulty because I'd have to re only reflect on other people's work or theory with regard to stakeholder engagement. And what I have seen directly and deliberately in terms of our actions, because we've actually been looking at environmental issues as opposed to social justice issues right now, because I live in a predominantly homogeneous white population uh, in Massachusetts um, is, that, is that you have to figure out the, the, the best example of stakeholder engagement are consumer-based com companies. They know how to differentiate their different markets based on what appeals to that market and align it to that particular market's interest. So if I could give just a nutshell answer, because it's a bigger answer than this, obviously, I would say what we fail at in terms of academics and in terms of policy is we don't incorporate a marketing-based stakeholder model where we actually look to see what incentivizes different groups of people that have different inherent interests with a common outward goal. And in many ways right now, uh, because of the issues that we face in terms of human made climate change, as well as other human issues that we've created in terms of just general pollution and environmental encroachment, we have a perfect opportunity, a crisis, so to speak, for those of you who listened to uh, yesterday's plenary, the comment that uh, by Milton Friedman that Stephanie ended the discussion with. Uh, we have a perfect opportunity right now to actually engage the general public with regard to a common goal. As to how we had engage separate sections of it, that is the art. It is a communication art and an, an actual idea of, of actually trying to come together to find the common ground that aligns that self-interest to the interest of the whole. And it can't be the proxy. Unfortunately, that's where I, I, I think that's a paper that really needs to be read, written, excuse me, is how the proxies have become the goal in economics and we've forgotten what they're actually trying to proxy. So perhaps maybe that's part of the reason why we fail in terms of really creating any kind of equity because we forgot that well-being is really the center or the focal point of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, we have one one comment in the chat. Oh, sorry. Are there any other questions coming in from the Q and A? Please go ahead and post them. I'm going to have. I have one question with uh, for for uh, Noi and and Marve. If you don't mind, is just a common question that both of you could could ad address. And that has to do with the, the concept of institution. It's, it's almost like a self-segregation that, that you're talking about when you talk about migrants and that self-segregation. Um, it leads to a trap. So basically you, you, you in, in some way, shape or form, the model almost conveys either you have self-segregation preservation because of a lack of inclusion or you forsake your diversity for inclusion by joining into the majority group. And I just had a comment there. And Lynn, I didn't mean to, I, in case you had another comment, I didn't know if you had one thing else. Uh, so I was just gonna point that out to you. Okay, I didn't think so, but thank you so much again. So that was my uh, question to both of you, because uh, it, it, it does seem like a trap. You know, we talk often these days about diversity and inclusion. Obviously, I believe, for me, so my comment, that inclusion should come first, diversity second, inclus inclusiveness by definition incorporates diversity, but the, the, the same is not true, vice versa. So any comments there, please? I don't want to jump ahead of Merve, but I, I do I do also have a little bit of an issue with the word inclusion, uh, just as much as with the, um, it, which is just as something I don't understand too, which is that you can be included so from the perspective of this tool that i'm proposed here is basically once one right you can you can still ex be in a very uh segregated society <clears throat> um 
once your immigration status is no longer predictive of incomes, but it's just segregated along all those other lines. And does that mean now this society is inclusive with respect to immigrants, but not with respect to those other dimensions? I just don't know that, you know, what, what does inclusion in that sense mean? One proposal from, you know, would be to take all those, um, what Romer calls uh, circumstantial characteristics. And once all those circumstantial characteristics are no longer predictive of incomes, then you have an inclusive society. But of course that, you know, like what, what about things like social class um, and, and so on. So I, I just don't understand that part very well. Yeah, if I, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, if that would be anyhow relating to what your comments, but I, uh, it reminded me of something about like the, how inclusion should come together with like some like agency. So um, th there was a project like recently, a recent project in the EU Horizon 2020, I was checking that out. It sounded like a very cool project to put, to include the newly arrived refugees in the, in some European Union countries. And at the same time, solve the issue of revitalizing shrinking areas in Europe. So the idea was to deal with two societal issues at the same time. And then, you know, one including the people. And what uh, I found a bit interesting in that project was that, I mean, it's, it's good to, you know, include people somehow and uh, convince the member states like with a benefit uh, so we, like providing a benefit for something else that is the shrinking uh, areas still it has a very much like pragmatic approach which disturbed me I believe and which was about agency so uh, yeah I, I don't think really this relates to what you're saying but I would like to say when we're talking about I guess inclusion uh, it's not just inclusion in contrast to exclusion but inclusion has to have also some sort of agency uh, included in that I don't know Thank you. I, we have uh, four minutes left, so I'd like to invite, I'm going to start with Robert, if I can. Any any last comments that you would like to make in terms of a key takeaway from your paper? Maybe perhaps we could just we could just have that, that opportunity, since we are taped and this can be re revisited for anybody who has access. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, my link uh, failed me, so I've missed part of the discussion, but I, I think I... Uh, Key takeaways are uh, the complexity of this, and, and I, I think that was reflected in, in the, the, the discussion that just occurred there about agency and inclusion. Uh, inclusion goes beyond, I think, uh, the, the, the sort of presentation of uh, club goods and uh, uh, the discussion around club, club goods and so forth. There, it, it relates also to our, our, our cultural and, and political uh, dimensions that Nancy Fraser uh, alluded to in her work. I, and I think a, a, broad, a broad framing of this could be, could be very insightful in terms of uh, progressing the arguments within a stratification economics framework. Uh, my key takeaway would be stratification economics. I, I think can be uh, a very powerful force uh, if it engages and there is engagement and it's informed by uh, other, other areas uh, that are dealing with issues of, of justice and so forth and we don't fall into the social science trap of talking past one another. I apologize if I've taken too much time. No, no, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I have my comment, but I want to ask for Noy and Marve if you have anything else that you'd like to just have as a, a takeaway, a key takeaway for people who've, who've been listening. Maybe just one point, which is that, you know, for people who are interested in stratification economics, um, it's clear that neoclassical economics just isn't very well suited for studying questions of social identity. And if you use the methodologies that they propose, you're, you're very, you're pulled into a, a difficult direction. And I hope people can pick up some of those, um, if they're interested, some of those tools that, that uh, we're using here. Yes, Marvick. My uh, key takeaway from the session is that 
I really feel that uh, the empirically oriented people should connect more with the theoretically oriented people. I mean, that's how, how I feel about it because, uh, okay, we're talking about certification and then there is this emerging field certification economics and there are many studies, very novel studies proposing novel tools such as the NOAA is doing or Stephanie Seguine is doing. But I really feel like we should really try to find more ways to connect this theoretically oriented people like myself or conceptually oriented people like myself and the others empirically oriented like Noe. So that's kind of my key takeaway from this session. And yeah, thank you very much for also sharing. No, thank you all very much. It was a pleasure to meet all of you. Fundamentally, it's who we are as human beings and hopefully the values and moralities that we espouse that become the realities around us that uh, I guess we're trying all of us to, to an analyze and help move the needle closer to. So thank you all very much. Have a wonderful day. Happy New Year. <laughs>